Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, if you have a Bible, do turn to Ezekiel chapter 36, and uh, we're going to start there. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you invite us to be holy as you are holy, and you give us the resources to do that. We pray you'll come by your spirit upon us today in a new way and help us to be the new people you've called us to be. Amen. Well, I'm delighted to share with you this afternoon and today we're continuing our series on holiness, holy here, on the imitation of Christ. And Stephen launched the service uh, the theme last week when he preached on that verse in 1 Peter, be holy as I am holy. It's an instruction, but it's also a wonderful invitation. But the question is how? How are we to be holy? And today is also Pentecost. And Pentecost is the day when we celebrate and remember the sending of the Holy Spirit upon the church. And the Spirit is given for many reasons, but one of which is to enable us to be holy as he is holy. This week I read uh, an article in Time magazine called How to Be the Best Version of Yourself. And it offered 21 actions. And some of them were okay, and some a little confusing, and some, I thought, contradictory. On the one hand, it said we are to use Twitter to network. Anyone doing that? And on the other, it said ignore social media. I wasn't sure quite how that worked. Then one said the best version of yourself should be your vision, not someone else's. Fair enough. And then it said, help others to become the best version of themselves. I thought, okay. I read another article similarly titled, Becoming the Best Version of You. And it suggested that you work out every morning. I thought, I get out of bed, it feels like a work, and so I can take that. But then unhelpfully, it said, drink a green smoothie every morning. Anyone do that? I don't even know what a green smoothie is, but I thought I don't want to do that. Fortunately, <laughs> holiness, which is the best version of yourself, which is the version that God, who loves you the most, who knows you the best, who wants the best for you, it's the picture, the frame, the goal that he has for your life. He doesn't tell you to drink green smoothies or even work out. There can be no holiness without the Holy Spirit. In Ezekiel, the prophet tells us that God saves us single-handedly. Seven times in the passage that was read to us, there are promises that reveal what God does for us on our behalf. Seven I wills. He will rescue us. He'll bring us together. He'll bring us home. He'll clean us up. It says that twice. He'll give us a new heart and he'll give us a new spirit. And in all of this, God is the agent. God is the doer. God is the subject of these verbs and these promises. And he's the one who does this for us on our behalf. And he does it for us in and through the Lord Jesus. We call it being saved. All the noble religions say, first, you make yourself holy. And you do that by prayer and service and law and sacrifice and offerings and devotions. And then if you've made yourself holy and presentable to God, then maybe God will save you. But one of the ways that Christianity is so radically different is that it inverts this. And it says God acts to save you first. And then having saved you, you work with him and walk with him 
towards holiness, towards the best version of yourself. Having described God's seven I wills, ending with giving us the Holy Spirit, Ezekiel shifts in verse 27 and moves to two you wills. From all the I wills, the things that he does to rescue us, to intervene for us, to bring us together, to clean us, to put a new heart in us, then, having given us the Spirit, he then tells us what we have to do, the part we play. And he says, you will be moved to follow my decrees and to keep my laws that he's written on our heart. Salvation, rescue, bringing us to God, forgiveness, turning away his judgment, making us just and right and righteous, acquitted and free to go on all charges. That is a work that only God can do. But holiness, becoming the best person we can be, is a work that we work out and walk out with God. And holiness doesn't come in an instant. Salvation does when we trust in Jesus. But holiness, becoming like Jesus, becoming our very best, that is a journey. And it doesn't happen by osmosis. There's no kind of let go and let God. On the contrary, holiness is both a gift when we trust in Jesus, but it's also a charge. It's a responsibility. It's a privilege that is given to us. 1,600 years ago, a portly, pious, Celtic bishop called Pelagius stirred up a real spat in Rome. Pelagius was struck by the verse that Stephen spoke on last week, where God says, be holy as I am holy. And this chap, Pelagius, he felt that if God calls us to be holy, and if God addresses us with that invitation, then in fact we have the ability, we have the, capac the capacity. He addresses our will, and we ourselves have agency to enable us to be that. We can comprehend the instruction, and we can comply with God's moral law. But there was an African scholar called Augustine. He was a big and brash guy, and he hit back hard. And he said, Pelagius, you are a refugee from grace. He said, if you could be holy like God, then you wouldn't need God, and you wouldn't need grace if you can do it on your own. And Jesus wouldn't need, needed to have died for you, and you wouldn't have needed to have been sent the Holy Spirit. And Augustine rightly won the day. That holiness is a work of grace and not grit. And Pelagius, the English uh, bishop, was outlawed as a heretic. I think Augustine was largely right. That God saves us single-handedly. That there's nothing we bring to our table but our needy and often filthy selves. Our hungry empty need. And we say, Lord, have mercy on us. And God is only too happy to do that. Augustine said, God, command what you will, but give what you command. And he does. But at the same time, Pelagius had a point. And that was that we are not passive in this journey of being holy as he is holy. We receive it as a gift of grace, by faith, trusting in Jesus, and then we receive the Holy Spirit who begins this work of transformation, and we work with him. We walk with him. We comply with him. We respond to his nudges. We respond to his inspirations, and together we are transformed. A few years ago, I wrote a book on holiness. It was called Different. And uh, I sent an early draft of it to our former rector, rector, our former rector, rector, 
David McInnes. And his response was really gracious. He wrote back, he said, oh, this is awfully good. Thank you very much. And then he, because that's how he talked. And then he said, I would like more of the Holy Spirit, though. And he was right. The whole weight of it was on what God wants and what we're to do. But through all of that, what God wants, he gives us his, his instruction. What we do, we're to comply with his instruction. There is the Holy Spirit that helps us, walks with us, and works with us, and does some of the heavy lifting. But to grow fit, to grow strong, to grow healthy, we need to exercise regularly, don't we? And it's the same spiritually. And Stephen used that analogy last week of going to the gym and of growing in holiness. And Christ's likeness is a bit like going to the gym. To become like him is a life spent in the gym with him. I went to a gym once in my life. <laughs> and it was in February of 1986. <laughs> and I thought, these are not my people. These are not my... I became a Christian shortly thereafter. I thought, these are my people, you know. But... Some Christians only go to the holiness gym once. They sort of sign up in January and have given up by February. But we're to work on this regularly. I went to work on all, just as you go to a gym and work on all the different muscle groups and work on your cardio. And as we were hearing last week, you need to learn how to eat well and sleep well. The Holy Spirit is like this kind of coach and trainer and dietitian, and gym buddy, and physio, and he works with us to enable us to be the best version of us. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is a moral flame. He's not just given for our entertainment, although when he comes there is joy, and there is life, and there is love. And he's not simply given for our employment, although he does give us gifts, and call us to ministry and service. The Holy Spirit is relational, and he comes to live within us, and he comes to join us with God the Father and God the Son. He's relational, and then he is a moral flame. The flame at Pentecost was a moral flame. You know, 90 times in the New Testament, we are told that he's the Holy Spirit. Not just spirit, but Holy Spirit. And this is a primary predicate for him. And what does holy mean? It means beautiful, spotless, perfect, righteous, set apart, blameless, as it's meant to be. And this is who he is. This is how he is. And it's not simply a, a, a primary predicate of the Spirit. It's a primary activity of the Spirit to make us holy as he is holy. How can we be holy? We're sent the Spirit who makes us holy. You know, plumbers plumb. A good one does anyway. Others take your money and don't. But plumbers plumb and butchers butcher and dentists do all sorts of horrible things. But the Holy Spirit does holy. He does holy in us. And when we receive more of his spirit, if we seek more of his spirit, when we welcome more of his spirit, he comes, but he comes as a moral agent to work in us and to activate holiness in us. How does he do that? Well, let me just suggest three things. He spotlights things. He shines the spotlight. And firstly, he, the Holy Spirit shines the spotlight on God's heart by writing God's laws on our heart. God puts on our heart the things that are on his heart by the Holy Spirit. You know, in the Old Testament, God's Spirit gave the laws, God gave 613 commands and instructions. It's been counted, uh, uh, and there's been some sort of slight variance, but essentially there's about 1,050 direct commands or instructions in the New Testament. 
Some of them are repeats. There are about 800 distinct instructions, imperatives, things for us to do in the New Testament. The Christian life is not DIY, do it yourself, or DYO, design your own. It's do what he says. And he is a God who has a lot of things to tell us. And together with the Spirit, we comply. These principles and these precepts show us what is holiness. They show us the way to holiness. They show us how it works in community. And it shows us the way to the best version of us. Written by the Spirit in Scripture and remarkably written by the Spirit on our hearts so that no one can say, well, I haven't read that and I didn't know. Because the Spirit within will lead us and guide us into all truth and reveal to us what is on the heart of God. And these instructions, a thousand of them, they're, they're not simply rules as an end in themselves. They're like a trellis through which we can grow and become the beautiful people he's called us to be, to enable us to grow into intimacy with Jesus and imitation of Jesus. That's what holiness is about. We imitate him and we have intimacy with him. You know, the church has often got holiness wrong and it's made more of the law than it has of the Lord. And it's failed to see that actually the law, these rules, these instructions, these precepts, these decrees, the things written on our heart, the things written in the scripture are there to bring us to the Lord. They're not just propositional, they're about relationship. Several generations of my family were from the exclusive brethren. And some of you may have heard of them. And they're a kind of special forces of holiness. And uh, they actually define themselves by holiness. And that's their main thing. Although I fear that they got it rather wrong. They're all about being separate. And being distinct. And being different from. Being marked out from. And have nothing to do with uh, others. My granddad was a well-known elder within it. A teaching elder. A preacher. But he actually was excommunicated. Can you believe it? And the reason he was excommunicated was because someone brought a question to the eldership saying, someone else who works for me has a radio. Should I sack him? And my granddad said, no, we, we don't do radios. They never had a radio. But if, if they're not brethren, they don't have to have a radio. Anyway, they kicked him out for it. And uh, for them, holiness often meant silly rules. My mum in the late 50s failed her high school diploma or equivalent because in English she had to write an essay and it was describe your favourite TV or radio personality. She'd never watched a radio. Uh, well, no one has, um, although they may have stared at it, uh, unless you've got mystical gifts. But she'd never heard a radio, she'd never watched a TV, and she, had ne she didn't know of any TV or radio personality, so she wrote a name, left it blank, and failed her high school diploma and had to leave school at 15. Listen, holiness is not pedantic and petty and arbitrary rules. The church often makes them up. It's not about special diets and special duties. And Jesus actually rebuked the, the Pharisees for building all these laws, he said, in which they strain the gnat but neglect the important thing. Holiness is not meant to make us look like Eeyore, but to look in awe. You know, some people, in some religious contexts, they look as if they've mistook the hemorrhoid cream for toothpaste. And, you know, both ways, it's not pleasant. That's not what holiness looks like. Holiness is your best life yet. Holiness is the imitation of Jesus. C.S. Lewis said, How little people know who think holiness is dull when one meets the real thing, Jesus, 
It's irresistible. So he shines the spotlight on God's heart written on your heart. And then secondly, the Holy Spirit shines the spotlight on Jesus. The Spirit promotes holiness in us by promoting holiness to us, by presenting Jesus to us. And he was, as Van Gogh put it, a matchless artist. I mean, who else? Who else has ever looked like him and lived like him and loved like him and died like him for the sins of the world? Whoever has been eternal God who became flesh to bring us to himself. Matchless. I was thrilled we sang that in a song earlier. The most beautiful, the most life-affirming, the most life-transforming person who ever graced this earth. He was a man fully alive. And everyone except the demons and the self-righteous, they were drawn to his goodness and his godliness, the hungry and the poor and the sick and the lonely and the oppressed and those who felt guilty and the, the tax collectors and the prostitutes and some of those who spent their life studying the law wanting to know the answers, the truth seekers, they're drawn to Jesus, the altogether lovely one, perfect in holiness. And his pure presence exposed people's sin. And his power expelled those shadows. And his holiness changed people. When people had spent time with him, they wanted to be different. Peter wanted the sin removed from his life. Zacchaeus wanted to just start giving away all his money to the poor and making things right. Being with Jesus, you want to be different. You want to be like him so you can be nearer him. And he personifies holiness. Jesus personifies holiness. He's holy in the flesh. And Jesus makes us holy in his presence. The Orthodox Church, Church of the East, describe God using an analogy of the sun that God is, as it were, the sun, the source of life and light and ineffable and unapproachable. But from him comes these rays. And that's the work of the Spirit. And uh, that we feel the warmth and the heat and the life and the energizing that comes from it. And we bask in it. And they call The process of holiness, the lovely word, they use a different word than we do normally. They use the word beatification, literally being made beautiful. That's holiness, the most beautiful you. And how are we made holy? In his presence. I love what they call heliotropes. Anyone know that word? Yes. They're sunflowers. And they turn in the morning. As the sun comes up, they kind of wake up and they turn to face the sun. And as they face the sun, they grow and they become what they are. And we're to turn and face the sun. We're to turn and gaze on Jesus. And as we gaze on him and look to him and draw near to him, as it were, we're transformed by him. We get the kind of divine sun. Holiness is like a divine suntan. And you can't get a fake spray it on one that rubs off in the shower. True holiness is what we become as we gaze at the sun. And it can't be had quickly. I woke up this morning thinking about that great David Bowie song. You know the song Changes? He says, turn and face the strain. Changes. I want to be a better man. And we're called to turn and face the sun. And when we do, a change takes place. And we become a better man and a better woman. And it's the spirit who turns us and orientates us towards the sun. It's the spirit who shines the spotlight on Jesus. He's not making much of rules. He's making much of Jesus who fulfilled them all. And we measure up to him. 
And how do we turn and face him? Well, we, we do it by the means, the, the means of grace that have long been used in the church. We do it by reading the Bible and asking him to speak to us. And as we read this, this becomes like a, a window and in, into grace, into the presence of God. We're knowing his mind and we draw near to his presence by prayer, by talking to him, by just lingering with him, by responding to what he's asked us to do, by receiving Holy Communion, by having prayer, by serving him with the gifts he's given us, by being in community and slowly his glory changes us to become like the one we look at. He shines the spotlight on Jesus. And then lastly, the Holy Spirit shines the spotlight on our own sin, on our own mess. Sin's, a, sin's such a harsh kind of word, but it, it literally means to fall away from God's best for you. To fall away from. The Apostle John said that the Spirit will convict us and challenge us about our sin, about God's righteousness, and about God's judgment and reward. He shows up the messy stuff. And he leads us to rethink and to repent and desire change. He's, the closer you come to Jesus, the more you see the mess in your own life. The more you ask for the Spirit, the more you're aware that there's just those areas in your life that need work on. And so sometimes we pull away from him because we just don't want to do the work. We just don't want him to put the finger, as it were, on that area. He's always putting the finger on me. There are so many things. And if the Holy Spirit didn't, my wife would, because she knows me well. She's like the Holy Spirit. And we've all got areas in our life that the Holy Spirit wants to work on. And he's always at work. And he doesn't do it all at once. And there isn't a one-off experience that can make us holy. Yes, positionally before God, but not practically. And he works on different things in different people. I've, I've noticed this over many years, that the things he might be telling me to, to work on in my life, the character issues and those places where I've got stuck, may not be the things that I can actually see in other people, but he's working on something else in them. And I'm not to judge them or criticize them from what he's doing in my life. i just got to be faithful to what he's doing it with me. We're not to uh, judge others and where they've got to. And he works slowly. Salvation can happen in a moment, but holiness takes a lifetime. It takes some a lot longer than it ought. You know, a baby is born quickly. I mean, even if it takes two days, it's relatively quickly. People come to faith and are born again very quickly. But then it takes a few decades for that baby to grow. And it takes years for us to become, all our life, the people that God wants us to be. But there is a trajectory and a goal. And it's in line with what he's written on our heart written in Scripture and revealed in the person of Jesus. And there's no shortcut and there's no quick fix. There's just hard, beautiful yards in the gym of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, though, is with us for the long haul. He's never going to leave us or forsake us. And he wants to work with us. The Pharisees pointed out people's sin but didn't lift a finger to help it. The Holy Spirit gently reveals it and then helps us work until that area conforms to Jesus. And why? Why would he bother? I mean, why ever does God bother with us? And the answer is, is that he loves us. Holy, holiness isn't the mean side of God and love the, the kind side. That holiness is the love of God. God never gave his spirit and his law to the angels. They work for him. But we're invited into his family. He has come to live with us. We are individually and corporately his temple. And he honors us by inviting us to become holy as he is 
holy. And he changes our hearts. And he changes our desires. And he does it because of his holy love. When I met and married Tiffany, I wanted to be the best version of me for her. I just did. She made me a better man. But I wanted to be the best version I could be for her because she was worth it. And she was worth me doing work on myself, my selfishness, and my issues, and my attitude, and my greed, and all of this. And it's still work in progress, but she was worth it because I loved her. But you know, the Holy Spirit also changes desires. When she married me, I'd been a butcher for years. She was a vegetarian for years. <laughs> and she gave it up for love. I mean, I don't, we never had the discussion. I may have contemplated giving up the bangers, but no, she did it for love changes appetites and desires. Let me finish. One of my favorite books is Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. It's an amazing story, and it's about a criminal called Raskolnikov who is transformed. He is an ethicless, moralless murderer. And he becomes transformed by the love of this amazing woman called Sonia. And eventually he gets caught and he is sent off to a labor camp in Siberia. And she follows him there in order to help him and serve him and love him. And slowly her goodness changes his rotten heart. And Raskolnikov, near the end of the book, says, maybe her God can become my God. And then the, the story ends, it says this, they were renewed by love. The story of the gradual renewal of a man, the story of his gradual regeneration, of his passing from one world into another, of his initiation into a new and unknown life. Love transforms him into the character of the one who loves him. And we're loved by a holy God. And the more we get to know that God, the more by his spirit, he will change our appetites and our desires and our nature and our character. And we will become like the one who loved us to death, the Lord Jesus. Amen.